Well this well this here if I put it on the floor. Oh, yeah. It's a bit awkward. Yeah, it's awkward. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, I actually thought about this last night. It's weird, you know. Um, I've kind of always had this picture of myself, like you know, this idea that I've carried around with me, you know, for, for my for my whole life. And actually, got actually got uh, drilled for it in treatment. Um, had this idea of myself that I was like, oh, this free spirited hippie, you know, nothing bothers you, like take it easy, chill, life's okay. I realized today in recovery that's not who I am, you know what I mean? I realized today more than ever that that's not who I am because I'm, I feel like shitting my pants right now. Um, this is difficult. But uh, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is that I've kind of learned to recovery um, who I am, or I'm learning who I am. Um, and one of those things being that I'm not this peace-loving, hey, life's cool hippie that I used to think I was. Um, chatted to, I chatted to a guy yesterday, um, Quite a wise friend of mine. Um, he gave me. I was chatting to him about my share and what's he saying. He gave me some sound advice. Uh, he said, "Don't, don't fuck it up." Um, and, uh, uh, so I hope I don't do that today. Um, yeah, we'll see where that goes. Sorry, I get really like all awkward when I'm nervous. So just bear with me. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I kind of, I kind of wish must, not wish, but you know, I hear a lot of stories of people who, who come into the world about guys who have um, developed a life for themselves, and, and they came in and they got certain things, and got a job, got a wife, got the car, had children, and then a really good job, and then, and then lost it all through their addiction. Um, that was not my experience. <laughs> my experience has been, um, from the time I was in school, I've just kind of been a but I don't feel it now, but what I was was kind of just a failure drug addict. And uh, yeah, I did fairly well in school academically, but once I left school, it's like I never really got anything, you know what I'm saying? I just kind of, I got, in, I got into drugs and from there it just kind of spiraled out of control really quickly. And before you know it, I'm like waking up, blinking my eyes, and um, I'm 24 years old and I've got nothing to show for it. You know what I mean? It's like that. It's kind of since high school to where I am now, I don't... Uh, I don't know where it's gone, you know, this, you know, I've spent quite a few months in, in rehab over the past few years and, and just trying to kind of get myself on track but never quite being able to do it. And uh, that's kind of been the story of my life, I've been incapable, you know, I mean, what I know today is I've been incapable of doing that um, by myself. Although I thought for a long time that I could, yeah, I could do it. I was on Facebook last night and it was, uh, the sponsor said I can go on Facebook now, so I went on Facebook. <laughs> Because uh, I've kind of stayed off for a year uh, to, to follow a suggestion, but I went on Facebook last night and I went and I just deleted, I deleted a whole bunch of photographs from, from the life that I was living, from the life that I, that I had. Um, a lot of photographs of, of myself with my ex-girlfriend and, and the old friends I used to hang around with, and I just went and I deleted the, the whole lot of them. And as I was scrolling through them, it was, I got this, I got this kind of sense of, I kind of felt sad, and when I say that, I mean like, uh, in a good way, you know what I mean? It was kind of a nice moment for me, although it was kind of small, just a nice moment to, to for once in my life, kind of say, you know what I'm not, like I say, you know, it was another symbolic moment throughout my recovery to say that that life's gone, you know what I mean? And uh, the life I've been given today is, is what I'm committed to and what, I'm, what, I'm, what, I, what I plan to follow through with. Um, but yeah, so I'll just share a bit of my story with you. I don't want to delve into a whole bunch of detail about when I was a child and get into all the psychoanalysis type stuff to why I am the way I am. Um, I believe I was born this way. Like I know today, I look back and I believe I was born this way. Um, I should have known something was wrong with me when I used to, when I was playing in the garden, like I'd get too lazy like, to go to the toilet, so I'd just poo outside in the garden. Like I should have known then that, <laughs> that something wasn't okay with me, you know what I mean? <laughs> I remember once I was busy doing it and my mom walked around the corner with a wooden spoon like, what are you doing? And I put my pants quickly and started running. I should have known then, at least you're not a cat. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that uh, at a further stage. Um, anyway, yeah, so I grew up a uh, fairly, fairly good family. Like I said, my, my, dad, my dad used to drink a lot when I was younger. Um, so I grew up kind of in that environment. And why I said it was still good is because... Uh, you know, when I was about 10, he went to rehab and, and kind of got his stuff sorted out. 
Um, but I was exposed to a lot of drinking growing up and a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of fighting in the house, you know. And I, like I say, that's something I blamed for a long time was, hey, you know, if, uh, if you kind of grew up in a house where, where there was fighting and there was stuff going on, you would also kind of be like me. Um, that, was my, that was my excuse that I carried around for a long time. Hey, you didn't see my dad driving out and, and doing what he did and, and all of that stuff. So I, I kind of blamed that for a long time. Something I want to share on quickly. What shattered that for me was when I was sitting in treatment um, for the second time. I think it was in 2017. I was sitting in treatment and uh, yeah, my family hadn't come to visit me for a while, um, understandably. But uh, they, they came to visit me, uh, and my brother, his wife, his, his two kids, and uh, my mom, my dad. And it kind of smacked me like a brick wall when I saw my brother. Um, and it's quite a comparison. When I saw my brother, he uh, grew up in the same environment as I did, grew up with the same parents as I did, went to the same school as I did, same church as I was in, um, same everything as I was in. But... Um, where he was in his life as opposed to where I was in my life, given the same background we came from, uh, something was starkly different. Like I say, he was married, he had two kids, one adopted, one, um, one of his own. He was, he was running a, a farm school for rural children. Um, he's got his own house. And there I was sitting in rehab again, you know what I mean? It smacked me like a brick wall that I can't blame anything from my past for, for where I was um, in my life, and that's, that's something that kind of stands out for me today, was uh, I am the way I am, and, and the decisions I've made is because I feel today like I'm an alcoholic. Um, I really do believe that today, and that's why I was where I was. So yeah, anyway, uh, I, st I started lying a lot when I was younger. I know a lot of people share about that, but it was, it was also kind of my experience where I tell a lot of lies. I developed this idea that... Uh, if I just denied, like you could catch me red-handed with something, you could catch me with the cigarette in my, ha in my hand. If I just denied it, like blatantly denied it, I thought like this, that's okay. You know, I don't protect myself, that's cool. Um, and I did that many times. There's a few instances that stand out for me. Um, yeah, my dad, my, dad was, my dad was sleeping on the couch one night and me and my friend were... Me and my friend were... Um, we wanted to smoke. This was about grade seven or whatever. My dad, was, uh, he had been drinking a bit and he put his cigarettes in his pocket and he was passed down on the couch. So <coughs> anyway, I crawled over the couch and I went down and I slowly, like very tactically removed the cigarettes from his pocket. Um, and it was, it was amazing. <laughs> we got it and anyway, he eventually stumbled, went back to bed. Um, so we, did, we, thought this, we thought of this cool idea. Listen, we take the blanket, we put it over our head, sit on the couch, and if we smoke under the blanket for whatever reason, it would stop the smell, you know what I mean? It won't be too bad or whatever. So we started smoking under the blanket, and uh, anyway, ashing on the floor and carrying on. And uh, Anyway, we went to the tobacco, yeah, back grade seven, we went into the, into the fridge, and there was a Savannah light bottle. And we thought, hey, listen, if we take a can opener and poke a little hole in the top, um, and then drink half of, it, half of it, the lid will still be on. They might not notice the hole for whatever reason, but you know, they won't know it's, it's us. Half a Savannah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, so we drank it and we're smoking and carrying on. And uh, I woke up in the morning, I got woken up in the morning by my mom saying, you, were you guys smoking in the house last night? And anyway, I was like, oh no, like, what, what are you talking about? And there's ash all around me, I smell like cigarettes, the blanket smells like cigarettes. Um, <coughs> And I uh, just denied it. I said, no, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't, I wasn't smoking. What are you talking about? <coughs> then came the manipulation and the lie and using my parents' emotions to kind of uh, get them to believe me. So what I said was, I said, mom, you know how dad gets when he's drunk. You know what dad's done. Um, I'm telling you this was dad and he just doesn't remember it. And I, I was crying. They're crying, you, know, you don't know. Like, it's not me. You know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> And I said that I know in my heart it wasn't me, you know what I mean? And I, I fully believed it myself. And uh, anyway, so how that, how that ended off was with my dad coming to me halfway through the day and he said, uh, listen, I'm sorry, it might have been me, you know what I mean? And in that moment I was like, fucking hey, Reese, you're good at this, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so that developed, but that was kind of, like I say, from a very young age it was lies. Um, and I used that manipulation very well. I think I developed that quite well. In school, there was another, another incident where we were caught smoking, and uh, this girl threatened to tell the teacher or whatever, but she didn't for a few months. And she eventually ended up telling the teacher that um, 
the guys were smoking. And I was out that day, so I didn't get the, my name wasn't mentioned, but one of my friends was in the principal's office, and he mentioned, uh, he mentioned, our name, he mentioned my name. So anyway, I got back to school later that day from the excursion that I was on, and one of my other friends had told me that, um, listen, they caught us, and this guy mentioned your name in the principal's office. So I went off to school, and I grabbed him, and I said, you fucking idiot, I'm destroy you for mentioning my name, and why couldn't you just take it for yourself and whatever? And he wasn't even smoking. He was just around us while we were smoking. And... Uh, so I got called to school, when I was in school, the next day the principal calls us, and what I had said was I had sat obsessively, like an addict would, that whole afternoon thinking about how I'm going to lie to get out of this situation. And I came up with this master plan. Um, anyway, so I got to school that morning, I said to all my friends, listen, when they ask us what happened, you guys just keep quiet, let me talk. Um, let me talk, I'll, I'll get us out of this, don't you worry. And uh, anyway, so this is all happening in grade 7, you know what I mean? So I was quite young when all of this stuff was going down. And uh, so he calls us, and then I start spinning this whole story. So I said, you know what, sir? This guy that mentioned my name, he was actually the one that was smoking. And uh, you see, we were all standing around, and we were at our friend's house. This guy came up to us with cigarettes and was like, hey, come, let's go smoke and whatever. And we were all telling him no. And anyway, he just thought, okay, well, I'll light up a cigarette myself. And... and uh, he was smoking, and now this girl's blaming all of us because she saw the smoke around us. And uh, the principal's like, ah, oh, is it? And all my other friends are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so anyway, the only thing that happened to us, because obviously you couldn't prove it, the only thing that happened was, hey, I had to pick up litter for like a week. So, so that's the kind of child that I was, eh? Um, I started, uh, I remember from a very young age, like I started drinking cough mixture. Um, because I liked the taste of it. Like, there was a lot of cross mixture lying around the house, so I would often go and, and uh, just drink the cough mixtures because I liked the taste of it. Or, you know, I mean, if there's always something not to do when I was younger, the idea, of, like what I know, is when there was something not to do, I was told not to do something. And for some reason, I was curious, I wanted to do it. I don't know where that developed from, but um, that's kind of what I did. So yeah, anyway, I won't share too much, but I eventually went to, yeah, like I say, then school continued, in, in, in primary school I was very naughty, very mischievous, I, I got up to a lot of crap, a lot of fighting, um, I was that guy, that kid. In high school that kind of changed for me. Um, I was put into an all boys school with about 1,300 boys around, and anyway, I was just a small, small guy in the school with big Afrikaans guys, like rugby players, and... Uh, you know, so I was kind of, uh, felt, I did feel very left out at times because none of the friends that I had from primary school came to the high school, and except for one guy that um, he kind of fit in very quickly and, and got on with us. I remember, I remember for two years, for about grade eight and nine, I vividly remember like going around from group to group trying to find people to be friends with. And uh, I was, uh, I remember consciously being very selective, like I would say, I can't hang around those guys because they're not kind of cool enough. There's a cool crowd, I, would, I need to go try and be friends with them for whatever reason. Um, for whatever reason, obviously now I know it's because I had low self-esteem, I wanted to be accepted by those cool kids or whatever. Um, yeah, I did my first, I, I used my first hardcore, not hardcore, but I did my first drug in that period. I, I, I can't recall, a lot of people say like, you know, their first experience with a certain substance was like this and it took away their fear or whatever. I, I, can't, I can't remember why I did it, you know, I didn't take it consciously to take away fear. My friends were doing it, I uh, just went and, and did it with them. All I remember was um, just smiling and things were amazing, you know what I mean? It was fun and I was laughing and, and things were cool. And I used this particular substance all the way through school. Um, Yeah, I believe there was a tree of knowledge. You know what I mean? I believe like uh, <laughs> I believe that I believe that I'd unlock the secret to life. You know what I mean? And let everyone to try this. Um, yeah, I was mad. Eh? Um, but yeah, anyway, I smoked a lot of the substance through school, and uh, I believe that's why at times I can be a little bit slow today. But uh, yeah, so I smoked it through school. I got into a relationship in high school with a girl that I spent seven years with which I believe today was another part of my addiction, was um, 
fixing of this girl that I thought was, would, would make me whole, like the affirmation from her and attention from her. One thing I have learned through looking back over my life is that I've, I've always been kind of insecure, kind of um, not okay, so I've always wanted affirmation or approval from people. It, it still plays out in my life today, like for whatever reason, I believe that your opinions of me means more than my opinion of myself, you know, so I kind of need to prove to, to people and I need people to approve of me to, to make me feel whole. And it was the same in this relationship. From very early on, I got very, very obsessed with this girl. And I don't encourage you guys, uh, anyway, you guys are all fairly old yet, but I mean, I would never encourage a youngster to get into a serious relationship at the age of 15, you know what I mean? Just emotionally not okay, you know what I mean? And then seven years later, Wondering why the relationship was in a mess. Yeah, I did, I did fairly well in high school. I matriculated with, with five A's, surprisingly. That's why I believe that the, it was the tree of knowledge, because um, I did fairly well. Uh, and with that came a lot of arrogance, like, oh, you know, obviously if the other guys are smoking pot, they would also get this. You know what I mean? So I started telling people, hey, you need to smoke pot because it's lobbying you, you know, like it has with me. And... Uh, yeah, just mad. But anyway, yeah, so I left school and uh, I got arrested. I got arrested like a week after school for, for going to get this other substance. Now, like I hadn't really done any street drugs, like hard street drugs until I left school. Um, and I got arrested for this, for this substance. Um, and I kind of thought, I remember sitting in the cell, like crying, and, and that's how I got exposed, was uh, calling my parents from the, from the police station saying, listen, I'm your golden boy. <laughs> in the police station, can you come help me? <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, they, they ended up coming and got exposed, and I sat in the, the cell for about a, a day or whatever. I remember sitting there, and there was this old uh, colored guy that was sitting next to me, and like, like a lot of people have shared in meetings, I also prayed to the get, get out of shit God, where I was like, listen, like, I even asked him, I said, do you think God can get me out of this, like, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, yeah, you must just pray, son, and this is coming from a guy that's sitting in the cell as well, you know, so I prayed, and whatever, yeah, it's long, long, long story short, I got out of that situation, and I stayed dry for about, about three months, just because I was a little bit shocked, and a little bit, um, weary but then my parents started to notice hey something's not okay with Reese you know it was only after school that they started noticing and I kind of hid it very well that's another thing I've, I've been able to do my whole life is it's hard a lot I, I believe I've always kind of been a fraud you know what I mean I've I taught in a school where I'm supposed to be a teacher I'm supposed to be a, an example to kids well, I'd go to school, suit and tie, be this pro professional guy, teach these kids, tell them about not doing drugs, then I would go home and do drugs and uh, sit in a little, I used to, my evenings for about two years were spent in a little, an old bird cage where my cousin was living because he was also a drug addict and we would sit in this little bird cage where he had to duck to get inside. And we'd sit in there using every night. You know, that was, that was my routine. Then in the morning, get up, suit and tie, go to, go to work. Hey, kids, don't do drugs. Life's good. You've got a good life for yourself, you know, if you just do what I've done, <laughs> you know, which is, which is not okay. Uh, I, remember, I remember doing that in church as well. I grew up, like I said, I grew up in a, a very Christian orientated background. So I was in church and I became a church leader and, uh, church leader and I used to play in the church band and I used to, um, teach kids about Jesus and, and, and stuff like that and, and I'd go home and use drugs. That's been the story of my life. It's just been a fraudster. So yeah, my parents started to catch on to, to what I was doing. Yeah, I don't believe I'd be sitting here today if I didn't love drugs. Like there was a point in my life where I absolutely loved the drugs. Um, yeah, if someone, there's, there's, someone, there's someone that often shares about their first experience with, with, the, with substances and it was kind of my experience as well. When I did eventually come out of that, once I got arrested and whatever and I was um, a little bit more confident now to start using, I started using again. And eventually I, I picked up this particular substance and it was my first time picking up the substance. Um, and again, I should have known something was wrong because I took this tablet and I'm uh, sitting there and like five minutes passes and I'm like, what's, what's the big deal with this thing? Like, there's nothing going on. Um, so I said to my friend, come on, give me another one. He says, it's not working. So I take another one. Um, 
And again, I'm sitting there like, this is lame, like what's going on? It's like, okay, let's just cut me another half, let's take it, I'll take another half and then see what. And then as you know, like 30 minutes later, it's like, and then I was like, oh God, this is it. <laughs> and uh, I won't lie to you, it was, it was amazing. It really, really was amazing. It's like everything just came to life, man. Um, like if someone scratched my head, it was like, <laughs> um, and I absolutely loved it. I thought it was, I thought it was absolutely amazing. And uh, what was funny about it was just sitting watching my friend play a PlayStation game. I sat there for hours, like, oh my God, jump, attack him, attack him. You know, it was like that. Everything just became so intense, <laughs> so interesting. Um, yeah, drugs. Eh? Anyway, so it was. It was a nice experience until the next morning. Until the next morning when I started to get that dread from that particular substance after coming down from it. And I felt like my soul was getting sucked by dementors from like all directions and I was about to die. And I was shaking and uh, obviously I'd maybe taken a bit too much for my first time and I was like, I'm never doing this again, oh God. And uh, Anyway, my friends eventually dragged me to my other friend's house to throw me into, they threw me into a pool to try and like, get me to come right because I was all over the truck. I was... <coughs> Sorry, my throat's going dry. Because <clears throat> I was a mess, you know what I mean? I was a mess that, that previous day. And uh, I, I remember consciously saying to myself, that, 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 that drug was cool, it was very cool, but I'm, I'm not going to do that again. Needless to say, the following week I, I was doing it again. And... Um, just became a part of my life very quickly. Like I said earlier, my, my journey was very quick once I left school. I didn't amount to much. Um, I just literally spiraled out of control very quickly once I picked up that particular substance. Um, yeah, because like I said, the feeling that it gave me, the feeling was nice. Like that's what I say, I, when, I, when I took the drug, it's not like I consciously took it to remove the fear or remove whatever was going on to me. I took it out of curiosity in the very beginning. Um, but what I, was, what I was attracted to about the drugs was the feeling it gave me. You know what I mean? That's what I, that's what I liked about it was I loved the feeling it gave me. I loved the fact that it made everything interesting. I loved the fact that um, when I took it, I also remember, yeah, like I remember taking it and... Um, talking to my friend's grand for a long time about her grandson who skates in New Zealand. And like, like I said, it was, it was nice being honored at the time. I love the feeling it gave me. I look back now and I, I can kind of see that it was, it was a way of changing my reality, changing the way I feel. Um, I hear a lot from my sponsor as well, who said to me time and time again, like, I've always just wanted to feel different to the way that I felt now. You know what I mean? Anything, anything but the way I feel now. And so I spiraled out of control very quickly. I, this was in my gap year after school when I found the substance. And I started doing it every, like, every weekend, um, then every third day. Um, and it got, got out of control very quickly. And uh, the, the, the feeling of, of coming down the next day was, it started, I started just getting used to it. Like, oh, it's just something that's going to come as a byproduct of taking the particular drug. And, and so I carried on. Um, I tried to sort my life out then because I'd been doing this for about a year now. And so I tried to sort my life out. And this is, this is where I believe my journey started in, in trying to get control over what I was doing. And I uh, started studying and I landed a teaching, a teaching post at, at one school, an intern teacher at a school. And um, yeah, that fixed me for a while. You know what I mean? I was working hard. I stayed away from the drugs for a couple months. I had my girlfriend. I had my relationship as well for a certain period and I was able to, to kind of manage it for a little while, you know what I mean, with this new job and this new thing that was gonna, that was gonna change my life. And I started teaching and like I said, I put a lot of time and effort into it and I did enjoy it at one stage and I was enthusiastic and I worked hard um, until the novelty wore off and that's another thing that's kind of been the theme of my life is there'll be something new for me to fix on. Um, and the drugs can kind of be manageable for a while, but then as soon as I get over that, it's like I resort back to using the drugs. And um, yeah, so like I said, I started teaching, and then once the novelty of that wore off, um, I resorted back to the using. I just want to share a bit about this whole period with me teaching, because... Uh, <coughs> 
Because, yeah, it's, it's something I feel quite guilty for today. That, uh, like, I know the only way I'm, I'm going to maybe get through that guilt and shame is to, to one day hopefully make amends in that area of my life to kids. But uh, I remember, one thing, again, one, whenever I picked up the substances, like, I would, I would go balls to the walls very quickly. Um, and I wasn't sleeping at night. I wasn't getting to, I wasn't getting to bed. I would, I would stay awake through the night and go to school to teach, these, to teach the children. And... Um, <coughs> I lost, I, was, I, was, I lost a lot of weight in that period, and the teachers were commenting, like, wow, what's wrong with you? I was coming to school with, with like, black rings under my eyes and um, going to the kids, and uh, the kids would say to me, why do you look so tired? Like, what's going on for you? And the excuse I used to say to them was, I uh, know oh, I've been marking your books all night, oh, stressful, you guys don't know, whatever. It got to a point when I, where I couldn't, I couldn't look people in the face. It was weird. It was such a weird period of, of my life because I, I was... I was so uncomfortable with, with how I was and the way I felt, and uh, I was just constantly anxious. I remember it was such a horrible period. I was constantly fearful. The drugs didn't take any fear away at that period of my life. I, I would spend the, the breaks that I had, usually when all the teachers were in the staff room talking about stuff, I would hide in the classroom and, and set my alarm and sleep for about 10 to 15 minutes while they were at break to try and get some rest. I remember dreading looking someone in the eye when a teacher would come to talk to me. Like I would dread looking them, looking them in the eye. Um, so yeah, it was a very, it was a very difficult period for me, and I just couldn't stop. Man, I remember saying to myself time after time, "Reef, go home today, um, do some work, put some effort into your studies, and go to bed. Like just go to bed. <laughs> Please, you need it." And uh, I would, because I'd be tired, I'd go to work and I'd be sitting there at 12 o'clock at work, I'm going to listen, I'm going to bed. When I get home, I need to go home and I need to go to sleep. Um, as soon as the end of the day bell went, it was like autopilot. I knew I wasn't going home. I knew I wasn't going to bed. I would get in the car and I would almost get like a second wind in me. Like, oh, okay, I've got some free time now, I need to go and use. And uh, I would. And so the cycle would, would repeat day in and day out. Um, obviously stopped, uh, I had to start taking off work because I couldn't function. The work started to, to, to question me, like, like they could see that I was burning out. Didn't see much work, which I obviously wasn't. Um, yeah, so that, that was a period. Um, my parents had gotten wind from someone, I still don't know how they got it, but they had gotten wind from someone that this is what I was doing again. And uh, so like I said, for, for quite a few years I put my parents under a lot of stress um, with them not knowing where I was and, and what I was doing at any particular time. So there's a lot of stress that came with that. Um, they got wind that, that I was using again, because again I was trying to hide it and whatever, and I did it quite well, but they got wind of it. Um, and so they called me, they, they called me one day and they came to fetch me from my friend's house and whatever, and they sat down in the lounge and they started questioning me. And uh, this was when I was about, I was about, I'm about 19 or so. Yeah, 19. Sure, I was 19, yeah. And again, just like I was when I was a child, um, lying and manipulating, uh, I owned the facts, I said, yeah, I'm using, but you guys don't know why I'm doing this. And the reason why I'm doing this is because... Uh, Brad's always been the golden child, like my brother, who, like I use him as an excuse, Brad always been the golden child, he's always done well in school, and you guys always been the favorite child, and dad was drinking when I was younger, and da 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 da, and uh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I'm depressed. You guys make me depressed, you know what I mean? That's what I said to them. And I said to you, you guys don't understand me, um, and I spun this whole field just like I was when I was a child, and um, so yeah, so. And I look back and now my experience today is kind of realizing that um, it's, not a, yeah, it's not about the drugs and alcohol. Like I'm, I'm, defective, um, I'm a defective human being, clean and sober. And uh, I lie, I become dishonest, I become manipulative. Um, I fear consequences, so I lie to get out of those consequences. And as a result of that, I'm living the secrets of life all the time. Um, where I've got to constantly hide from everybody, constantly... Uh, watch my back, watch who I've told once, and that separates me from the world, and that's kind of why I felt, felt so isolated my whole life, is because that's how I lived my life. You know, I used to live my life very secretively, so, and then wondered why I felt isolated or depressed, and like no one gets me, because I, never, I was never honest with anyone about what I was doing. Um, so anyway, yeah, this, this is where, like I said, journey started for me. I, I got taken to the doctor to go get a drug test, and, and anyway, I didn't need it, because I owned up to what I was doing. 
And again, I told the doctor, listen, I'm depressed. Like, um, I'm depressed. I can't. That's why I use, what I, that's why I use the drugs. And uh, so he came out with this pill. And what he said to me was, it's quite interesting. He's like, listen, son, it's not, um, it's not the drugs that are going to kill you. What's going to kill you is the depression. So um, I'm going to give you a drug. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so he... He said to me, listen, this is like a new, new market antidepressant. You can't overdose on it, so, um, so don't try. <laughs> um, it's quite hard to be depressed when you're like this. Because <laughs> that's how I felt when I took the tablet. I got home that night and I took this tablet, and within five minutes, it's like I couldn't see my parents. I was like, I was like they looked me at them, bloodshot red eyes. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful. And um, I, pa I passed out. Within five minutes, I was on my bed, like I say, drooling, and I was knocked out from this particular... It was quite a, obviously, a high dosage of, of antidepressants. And um, so I got up and went. I kept taking them because, like I said, it was extremely hard to be depressed when you're knocked out. Um, what it didn't do for me, it obviously didn't take away. There was no solution. It was dealing with the depression by knocking me out, so I didn't have anything to think about, but it wasn't kind of getting to the crux, like I said, of dealing with with why I was the way that I was. Um, so I started taking that for a while, I started taking that, and uh, there was no solution there. Very quickly, soon after that, picked up drugs, picked up the street drugs again, and, and so I carried on. Um, so I left, I left the job that I was in, I left the job because I, I wanted to pursue a life, and I wanted to become a tattoo artist. This was my grand plan, and this is what I share about now, my grand plan is an addict. I was like, you know what, okay, so the school's obviously not facilitating my drug use. It's not, the lifestyle I want to live was I want to be a drug addict. I want to be able to live this alternative life because no one understands. Everyone's conforming. I don't conform um, as an addict, which is what we think we do. Um, but I'm not going to conform to this way of life. I don't see why I've got to be a teacher. So what I'm going to go do now is I'll go, because I was fairly good at art. Um, so I thought, listen, I'll go, I'll go become a tattoo artist, what I'll do. Um, because I know that you can use and carry on in that um, in that profession. So this was a grand plan. Like I started looking up on the internet about like where you can go for internships and like oh, uh, and uh, so like I said, like my plan and how things work out. So I left the job, and um, within a month, within a month of leaving that job, I was down on, on my off. I was using every day, all day. Uh, I was flat in my girlfriend's house every day. Like I was. Uh, Obviously, because I had nowhere to stay. Like I said, I was bumming with my parents and going to her house and living with them. Every day I was just using. Um, I, would use all my, I would use every day and just sit and isolate in, in that house, dreaming about becoming a tattoo artist. <laughs> you know what I mean? They had a plan, but uh, just uh, incapable, like I shared earlier in the beginning of my share, um, not being able to, to follow through with any of those plans. And uh, I was down and out very quickly. Saying bless your soul. I did. I did a lot of. Da uh, there was a lot of terrible things that I did in that relationship to her as well. Um, very demanding. I realize now. I look back. The relationship. Why I stayed there for for seven years. It's not because I loved her. Um, there was always something in it for me. You know, whether it was whether it was sex, whether it was um, the affirmation she gave me, <coughs> um, the attention. I became so controlling in that relationship. I'll check her phone all the time for Facebook. I'll, I'll sit high on drugs all night, um, obsessively scrolling through the phone, looking for evidence that was not there to try and prove that she was doing something with other guys. And then, like, I would find like something that wasn't actually a big thing, and then like question her f for it for days. Became really insecure. Like I say, I just I just became a mess in that relationship, and I did I did a lot of. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of harm emotionally um, to her, and uh, yeah. So just to how much time do I have left? Oh jeez, time flies. Okay, yeah. So anyway, I eventually reached out to her, and I went to I went to treatment my first time. I reached out to my parents, and I came to treatment my first time, and uh, up on the house on the hill. And I remember saying to. Uh, I came to treatment willingly, this was funny, I came to treatment willingly to try and get better, but I, I still kind of believed that the drugs and the alcohol were, were my problem, and if I could stop using drugs and alcohol, then I would find a way to become that tattoo artist or to become that teacher, um, because the drugs and the alcohol were the problem. So to cut a long story short, I was very enthusiastic for the first month in treatment, and I gave uh, 100% for 50% of the weight, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And it got to about a month and a half, and I was being sponsored by Josh at the time. Um, and I used to listen in Big Book, and I was like, I started, my head started finding loopholes. And it's funny because up at the treatment center, we've been discussing that a lot this week. And I started looking in the big book, and I came up with this grand excuse as to why I can go. Um, because I, I, I recognize now in my glory, I recognize that <coughs> Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob didn't, they weren't at Cedars. So if they were able to do it um, <laughs> outside Cedars, um, surely I must be able to do it outside Cedars. All I've got to do is just go to a few hospitals, carry the message a bit, um, find a few alcoholics on the streets, like, you know, just to do what they did, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I went to Josh and I said, hey, listen, Josh, I've, uh, yeah, I'm going to go. <laughs> um, I've, got this, I've got this sorted out. Um, these guys didn't come to see this, um, so, so I'll do that. And he said to me, listen, it's not going to work. And um, I said to him, how do you know? You're not God. And he said, where's your step one? And I was saying, how do you know I haven't taken step one? And I came up with all these, all these arguments, all these plausible but untrue reasons why I wanted to leave. So needless to say, I had this plan. I was going to then go out, study with my ex-girlfriend. We were going to fly to Thailand. This was the plan. And anyway, so I left. And um, three months later, I was high. <laughs> you know what I mean? Three months later, I was high. And I remember Josh telling me on his hand what was going to happen. He gave me a list of things that were going to happen. And I was a typical arrogant and alcoholic. No, I never. You guys don't know. And da 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 da. Um, like we all do at times, the journey. And um, anyway, everything he said was going to happen to me happened. I lost a girlfriend. I lost jobs. I didn't finish studying. Um, I relapsed. I hurt my parents even more. There was a lot of pain that came as a result of that. I started going to the rooms again to try and get clean because I was going to prove to you, oh, I can do it, I don't, need, I don't need this place. So went to the rooms for a bit, couldn't stay clean. Then comes another grand plan. Okay, I'll we'll fly to Thailand. <laughs> you know what I mean? We'll go with my ex-girlfriend, we'll come from this plane, we'll fly to Thailand because uh, Thailand will sort us out. When I go to Thailand, I'll be in a new place, um, new experience, there will be none of my old friends, I'll be okay. I was incapable of saving any money. Um, I, I tried to save to go over, but I was, just, I was just spending so much money on the using that I was going through at the time. Yeah, but to cut a long story short, again, I eventually managed to raise some money through work and, and obviously stealing, which is not, um, not something I'm proud of today, but I stole a lot. I stole a lot, I stole a lot through my whole act of addiction, but um, yeah, I just want to try to speed it up so I can get to my recovery. But yeah, I jumped on the, we jumped on the plane to go to Thailand, and it was like, wow. It was like, wow, this is it. Like, despite all the warnings everyone in the room gave me, in the room said to me, Reese, don't go. You're high all the time. <laughs> don't go to Thailand. It's not a good plan. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? Like, it's Thailand, you know what I mean? I'll go sit in the Buddhist temple for a while, like, find myself. Um, so this was my idea. Like, I'll be sitting in Thailand, lovely beaches, it'll be amazing, teaching little Asian kids, um, maybe adopt an Asian kid, um, life will be great. The way it ended on the second night was with my ex, so we, anyway, we landed in Bangkok in a dingy hotel where there was a stench of, like I swear it must have been dead bats or cats or whatever they were cooking in the little alleyway in Thailand. I was sitting on the balcony. The next hotel was like about a meter away I could smell the smell. My ex-girlfriend was crying on the bed um, because she was hating what was going on between us there. I could smell the smell. I could hear people having sex in the room above me, which was in the other hotel. True story. And I'm sitting there drinking beer, smoking a cigarette, thinking, what have I done? Like, this is horrible. You know what I mean? There was no drinking margaritas on the beach and teaching Asian kids and, and whatever. Four days later, we were back on a plane back to South Africa, and the day after that, I was back in rehab. And um, yeah, relationship over. Uh, so it's like, there's a plan, the plan in the reality. Um, and I came into treatment willingly, and this is where I started to, I started to kind of want to get better. Um, and I spent six months here, and I got a lot of self-knowledge on, on, on what I am and uh, how I think I need to treat myself. So I spent six months there, and I went out into the halfway house where um, I got a job. And I look back now and what I realized was that I thought self-knowledge would keep me clean. I thought 
an understanding of myself and, and my disease would, would kind of keep me clean. And I came out and I got on with it, but there was no real action in terms of working the program, in terms of getting honest about stuff and um, sharing what's going on for me. I still kind of done what I've always done my whole life, which is play a, play a role. Get everyone to think I'm doing okay, and if everyone thinks I'm doing okay, then somehow I'm magically going to be okay. And um, I was clean for ten and a half months, and uh, insanity came back. By seven months in, I was obsessing about using. I planned about using. I was so deep in it that uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't get out. And um, on October the 13th, Friday the 13th last year, not a good day to use, but anyway, I picked up and, and I relapsed that day. Um, so yeah, if any of you relapse, don't choose Friday the 13th of October to relapse and be outside in the doo-doo in the sugarcane fields all night. It's not good. Um, the paranoia I went through was extreme. Um, there was no fun in it. There was no, there was no relief. Um, what, what came over me straight after I relapsed was fear of um, what I'm going to do. Um, it's paranoia. I spent my whole night climbing out of an electric, in and out of an electric fence, convinced that something's going to kill me. Um, I don't know what. And anyway, yeah, so I ended up in, I ended up down in the sugarcane fields close to, close to where, where the treatment center is. And I remember very vividly sitting there with the Captain Morgan bottle and um, it hit me then, you know what I mean? I made the call. I tried to call my sponsor at the time. It was still very early in the morning, so I didn't expect him to answer. But I, I made the call back to the treatment center. And when I got back, it started to dawn on me. Um, <coughs> And I believe now that, that that's, what, that's what my step one was about. It started to dawn on me that, listen, Reese, your best efforts to stay clean and sober, your best, your best attempts to stay clean and sober in the past has failed you. You know what I mean? I, I, remember, I remember feeling very hopeless, thinking to myself, um, I've tried this, and I think it's not going to work. Um, so there's nothing else I could do. But I felt, I felt very hopeless. I felt like, listen, if, there's, if, there's, um, Trump, if I'm going to get better, something needs to change. Something needs to change internally and mentally because I kind of connected with the fact that this, whatever this is, Reese, the mind and, and my feelings, they don't work. Um, they don't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? My best plans had failed me. Everything failed me in life. And I was sitting there again, a complete, um, complete failure. So I believe this is where my journey started. Um, <coughs> I know people don't like to share about it, but I, I do believe, I, I do believe within myself that, uh, that I conceded defeat then and said to myself, you know, that this, it happened a while, it happened a while to me, I still felt a lot of self-pity, but I remember distinctly around step three, ironically, where I said to myself, um, like, come hello high water, this is what I'm going to do in my life now, because there's, there's not an option anymore, you know, the using is not an option, the way I was living is not an option. So I made a very clear decision to, to, to do this no matter what. And uh, from then, it's just, it's literally, it's, it's, it's taken off, you know what I mean? From that decision that, that I made, there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of good, positive change in my life. Um, yeah, there's been times that, uh, not, all, not all a bit of roses, because I'm still dealing with myself, I'm still kind of dealing with my head. My sponsors had to tell me over and over again throughout this year that, Reese, like, what goes on, your, on, your, on in your head and, and, and the way you feel at times doesn't matter. It's not, it's not who you are. And that's kind of what I've realized for me as an addict and what's kept me trapped for so long is I've been, there's three things in my life, I would, this is the way I like to see it, it's like there's my thoughts, there's my feelings and then there's reality, <laughs> you know, like what's real. And I'm obsessed with like my feelings firstly and obsessed with like the way I think. Um, the last thing I'm obsessed with is the thing I should be worrying about which is my reality and what I'm doing on a daily basis is the thing that I think of the most. I'm always thinking about my thoughts and my feelings and then judging myself according to that. Um, so what I had to start doing, and this was kind of where things changed for me as well, what I had to start doing was stop, stop thinking so much and just start doing. Just get up each day and, and do the best I can with that day. And it starts as, for me, re recovery started when I was getting up and, and making my bed and um, making, get up, make, making my bed, going on the walk, doing what I need to do, making someone cu a cup of coffee, um, and getting on with it, you know. Someone told me in treatment that, Reese, if you want to build your self-esteem up, start, um, start doing things for other people. Start doing things for people that people don't know about. Start, start doing that behind-the-scenes stuff and not trying to be in the limelight like I've always kind of wanted to be in my life. And I started to do these things, and, and like I said, really, really did change. Eh? Um, I remember being on a pink cloud for, for a large part of, of my, my recovery this year, where... 
where things just everything's been amazing. Yeah, like I say, there's been periods where I, where I went through extreme madness, and my sponsors had to tell me to really stop thinking, get out and go and do things. Um, but it's really, really been amazing. It has been amazing. Things started to change very quickly for me. I left treatment, and it's quite amazing how God, when I believe when I made that decision to do this, come hello, how water, like how God has then guided me um, to where I need to be. Um, because I went out, I looked for a job religiously. The guys that were in the half house with me at the time will know. Like I had my suits in town, I was looking, and I, everywhere I went, the door was just closing. Like I wasn't able to get a job. Um, and then circumstances unfolded and I got an opportunity to go back to the treatment centre where I was at and, and volunteer and do what I had to do. So, um, yeah, I learned to paint this year. <laughs> That's another thing I did a lot of, like I did a lot of painting. Um, I paint, tried to paint my sponsor's house and failed miserably. Um, it was horrible. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I started painting a lot. and. Um, my life is my life's kind of busy today. I was telling my sponsor as well last night, like I haven't had much time to sit and obsess about the share because my life's been so busy. I'm studying at, at the moment two things that I've been studying for. I've got my exams coming up. I've just started doing something new at the treatment centre where, um, where I've been volunteering and there's new opportunities there that there's been so much going on like that I've, that I've, had, that I've been obsessing about that I didn't actually sit down to start thinking about the share um, until this morning. But... Um, yeah, I'm on, I'm on a WhatsApp group now with my family where they send me messages and talk to me where I can see what's going on in their life. Um, today's my dad's birthday. Last year I missed his birthday because I was in rehab. I've missed the past three Christmas, the Christmas days with my parents because I've been in rehab. Um, I missed birthdays. Um, it was quite a nice moment to be able to call my dad today and wish him happy birthday. You know, because last, last year I didn't because I was sitting in rehab. Um, and just obviously he's too self-obsessed to even, even think about him. Um, but yeah, without harping on too much, like I do believe, um, yeah, I just, I just do believe that this program only works, well, it's only worked for me, it's only started working in my life when, when I made a decision to jump, all, jump 100% in the boat, because like what I've always done is I've been one foot in the boat, the other foot out the boat, checking it out, just seeing how it is, and if it lives up to standards, then I'll continue. But um, what I decided was this, and just I'm just going to throw myself in the boat. And, and what's happened since then has been absolutely amazing. Um, I'm going on to hopefully start making amends to the people of to the people in my life um, that I caused a lot of uh, trauma for, or, or um, yeah, the, the people in my life that that are that are hurt at times, you know. Um, Hopefully going into that soon and that will be a new experience. But yeah, I'm just, I'm very grateful to be here today. And sorry if it went on for a bit, I don't know what the time is. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope I didn't bore anyone. Hopefully someone got a message. So thanks for letting me share. Thanks. Thank you.